All right, welcome back to Monday Night Bible Study. Continuing in our study in Acts chapter 2, we'll uh, pick up uh, around about verse 14. Uh, last week we went over some of the things of the uh, incredible occurrence on the day of Pentecost. We talked about the Jewish feast, how uh, Pentecost fits in there, and uh, the disciples gathered there and the sound of the rushing mighty wind and the Holy Spirit came and they uh, spoke in tongues and they cloven tongues as a fire that uh, <clears throat> sat on them I would assume appeared to cut over their head or maybe they were larger than we think we don't we don't know uh, these were signs as we we know we've seen time after time signs are to Israel Really, you know, weren't signs given to Gentile peoples. Uh, the signs were given to Israel. So these are signs to them of the fulfilling of God's promise to send the Holy Spirit. And uh, the uh, flames of fire were, were also uh, signs to them of the fulfillment of God's promise to them that he would do what he said he would do. And so this was uh, an empowerment for them to carry out what they needed to do at the time and what their mission at the time was to be witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Because they were now, as we'll see as we go into Peter's message here on the day of Pentecost, <coughs> they'll begin to proclaim the resurrected Christ to Israel and still that he is their Messiah and their point is and is going to be that uh, the, of all of the signs, wonders, and miracles that he did were validating signs of his Messiahship, the fact that God raised him from the dead, that absolutely sealed it, that he was the Messiah. And that convinced a lot of the people, as we'll see as we go through this. So let's pick up at verse 14 and uh, begin to read. <clears throat> but Peter... Standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Now watch this, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Now, here's where we uh, need to remind ourselves, but always apply our Bible interpretation methods, those simple things we talk about a lot. Who is speaking or writing? Who are they speaking or writing to? And what are they talking about? What's the time frame? What's the significant place? In this instance, all of those things are significant. But here we find this is Peter, and he's talking to Jews only. There aren't any Gentiles here. All of this stuff and everything we're going to see for several chapters is all about Gentiles and their covenants and things about their scriptures and on and on and on. Prophecies to them within their prophetic program and all that. Still with the kingdom in view because they're still expecting it. But we're going to see uh, they're expecting the day of God's wrath to come. So <clears throat> that's who the address is to here. This is not general instructions to every Christian. This has no bearing really upon... Uh, Gentile believers, other than all of the scriptures are for our learning, but uh, this was something that was happening, fulfilling prophecy of God's dealing with the nation of Israel, because they're entering into a time that is Israel's extension of mercy, whereas God by rights should have poured out his day of wrath on the whole world when they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, but instead he extended mercy to Israel and gave them, I believe, about a year, space of about a year, to repent and uh, accept the sign that they asked for, which is Christ's resurrection, and they got the sign they asked for, and he gave them time to properly respond to that. Many, many of the Jews did, and they became part of that believing remnant of Israel. But nationally, the leaders 
pretty much just kept right on. They rejected Christ well. But we'll see that in detail as we go through here. Uh, <clears throat> you men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For the, you know, we can assume that, that all those from different nationalities, they're all hearing Peter and, and they're all, he's still the speaking in tongues thing is still active here and they're still hearing him in their own languages. For these are not drunken as he supposed, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. If I understand right, that was about 9 a.m. So he's saying, you know, these aren't drunk. Uh, it's, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. They, you know, wouldn't even really be able to get drunk by then. They wouldn't be. Um, so, <clears throat> and besides, with what was going on, you don't see drunken people doing that. People don't get drunk and then they're able to clearly and legibly speak in foreign languages that they don't know. Then he goes on to say in verse 16, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. One of the things, well, let me go ahead and read uh, verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. All right. <clears throat> We're going to stop right there for a second. We want to talk about a couple of things. Uh, first one is, Peter says it shall come to pass in the last days. Now, he had just made the statement. This is what you see happening right here. The Holy Spirit coming and the speaking in tongues and these, these things. These are things that were spoken by the prophet Joel, and you are seeing the fulfillment of those things. Well, now, if those things were fulfillments of things that would happen in the last days, then what time period do we uh, can we be sure of that Peter thought they were in? They thought they were in the last days. And there's other statements. I think Jesus made some about the last days and so on like that. Uh, so they, they believed they were in the last days and with good reason. But here's what we have to understand. They're not thinking about the last days from the same perspective that we're looking at the last days. And the last, day, the, the last days are a specific period of time. And I meant to... Uh, print off copies of the uh, chart with the five cycles of judgment. I should have, and I forgot today. I'm busy uh, working on a paper, and I forgot all about it. But anyway, I can make just a... Y'all, if you remember from back when we went through and we, we talk about this from time to time, the, the five cycles of judgment, and I'm just going to... I don't have a lot of room here, but I can do a somewhat of a timeline. There's a, There was like the first and then there was a short space with David and Solomon kind of a, about 80 years of a interlude of mercy similar to what God did here there was the first we'll call it the cycle of punishment there was a second in the in the first one this was during the time of the judges that's when uh, you know God had told them if you if, if you if you I'll bless you if you listen to my voice and keep my commandments and so forth. These good things will happen. If you don't, then uh, you're, you're going to have uh, sicknesses and diseases, and your enemies are going to come in and take all your crops. Well, we know that happened in the time of the judges. Remember Gideon? He was hiding in the wine vat trying to thrash enough grain to keep from starving to death. They had crops, and the, the Midianites had come in and take them, and the Philistines had come in and take them, and whoever else had come in and take all their crops. Second cycle of punishment was uh, the God said in all this in Leviticus 26. Uh, he had said, "I will break the pride of your power, and your heavens will be as brass, and the earth will be as iron." That would be the kingdom would be divided, and they would have drought. But during that second cycle of punishment, that was Elijah when he came on the scene. And sure enough, what happened? Three and a half years of drought, no rain. And also, because of what Solomon had done, his sons, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, are the two that split the kingdom. 
And it was civil war and it was division from then on. Uh, the northern ten tribes of Israel and the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the south. In the third cycle of punishment, um, and all of these had, you know, their certain triggers and their certain verifying signs. And the third cycle of punishment began after Elijah had gone up. Uh, the prophecy was that if they, you know, continued to disregard the Lord, not listen to his voice and, and these things, uh, he would send uh, wild beasts and teeth of beasts and would eat their children and, you know, reduce their population. It would be so bad. Restrict travel and all that. So at the beginning of the third cycle of punishment, that's when Elisha was going up through uh, Gilgal and Bethel and the uh, children ran out there and they were mocking him because he was a prophet. They didn't want him there either. He had shaved his head in mourning of, of Elijah, you know, was lost. He, he considered him dead and uh, they were making fun of him. So you go up too, you know, go up thou bald head. Well, it wasn't they were just out there making fun of him. They wanted him to go. They didn't want him there any more than they wanted Elijah. So what happened? Those bears came out of the woods and ate 42 of them. So anyway, uh, then the uh, fourth cycle was uh, they would suffer siege and famine and loss of territory to their enemies. <clears throat> that all happened. And then the, when the fifth cycle It's actually in five parts. Let me draw five out here because it, it's the last one, obviously. First cycle was 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Second uh, part of the fifth cycle was... Uh, about 49 years when they came back and the temple was rebuilt and all that, but the city was still destroyed. Uh, the, the third, let's see, do I got that right? The third, uh, <clears throat> yeah, third cycle was the 400 years of, of silence when there were no prophets in Israel. And then the uh, fourth cycle, this was John and, and Jesus, the days of the Messiah. Uh, and right at this point, Okay, all of, I guess we could say, this is what happened here. And at this point, at the end of the fourth part of the fifth cycle, that was like right here. And so uh, <clears throat> all of this fifth cycle of punishment, this is what, when Peter is talking about it shall come to pass in the last days, this is what it was talking about. So from the time they went into Babylonian captivity uh, until actually, because there's a break in here, it stopped there. This is the where we are now, the dispensation of grace. And it kind of, it started about there when Paul was called out. And at the end of that fourth cycle of punishment for Israel, that's when God stopped their prophetic plan. Now, because Peter and the apostles and, and all of them, they were in this fourth cycle of judgment, and they knew that, and they knew that this period of time was uh, what the Bible defines as the last days. That's why Peter calls this the last days. Now, there's another thing that indicates to us that this was the last days. And that was Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. 490 years, he said, are, 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 are set aside for the nation of Israel, because God, within that 490 years, he's going to accomplish some things. And what he was going to accomplish was bringing to an end all of this stuff in the five cycles of punishment that he told them he was going to do all the way back there in Leviticus 26. If, you know, if they did the stuff that they weren't supposed to do, which they did, and so wound up in all of this. So uh, with all that, 
said, the, the point is that <clears throat> we, we have a, a tremendous amount of confusion today about the last days. And I know a lot of preachers and prophecy people and so on, they, they go on about, oh, we're in the last days. And they expect, they especially think that because Israel re-emerged as a nation, in the land of Israel in 1948, they think, oh man, that started the, you know, the last days, and we're in the last days, and prophetic things are happening, and we got blood moons, and all this nonsense going on, and volcanoes, and earthquakes, and hurricanes hitting the U.S. coast, and all this kind of stuff. That stuff's always happened. You know? <laughs> I had a lady tell me that today. She said, we're living in the last days. Yeah. Plagues. We're talking about army worms. Oh, that, that, that's always happened. There's always army worms, you know, in certain conditions. You, you know. And I wanted to kind of say something to her, like, you know, yeah. there's plagues, grasshoppers, earthquakes, you yeah. know, all kinds of I stuff, mean, you know, waiting for this. And, and yeah. those weren't the last days either. No. Uh, yeah, and for good, good friend of ours to dig. And uh, he, you know, he's he's kind of a believer in all of that, you know, the blood moon stuff. Yeah. And I give him a hard time about it. Well, this is the year to dig. He started to talk about the, the all the hurricane stuff, you know, the hurricane because the U.S. broke some treaty deal with Israel or made some deal with the Palestinians or something, and a hurricane hit, you know, and Hurricane Katrina hit because the U.S. had made some deal with the Palestinians and all that. And anyway, you know, uh, I just couldn't help it. I said, man, look, you know, that's all, that's, that's all a bunch of nonsense. It's because what about, what about the hurricanes that happened way before Israel ever became, an, what about the hurricane that hit Galveston in 1900 and killed 6,000 people, you know? What about that one? And I said, besides that, these, these are natural disasters that hit the Gulf Coast. I said for, you know, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana is like a, a hurricane target. It's normal for hurricanes to hit, you know, Louisiana. <laughs> I said if God was going to send a hurricane to prove some point and, and smack the government, the U.S., because we made some deal with the Palestinians, why did he send a hurricane to Washington, D.C.? I mean, that would have, you know, seemed like some kind of a... Uh, Retribu uh, retributory side, I guess you want to say, but anyway, so we don't talk about that kind of stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just, you got to think about all that stuff. But anyway, you know, uh, we we tend to think that we're in the last days. Well, the point I want to make here, and, and this is just to stop some of the confusion so that we're not confused about this, that the last days that Peter's talking about here and anywhere else, especially in the New, Te New Testament or even in the Old Testament prophecies, when it talks about the last days, it's talking about that period of time when they were expecting the kingdom to come in and they were expecting the day of God's wrath. Because remember, they didn't know anything about the time period that we're in now. They were expecting all those tribulation time stuff that was prophesied. They were expecting all of that stuff to happen just shortly. So we'll see. Peter will speak warnings about that. So anyway, I just wanted to... Well, and I know that, that when you hear somebody in passing and they're talking about these are the last days, I know that you can't break out your whiteboard and go into a big long, you know, this is not something you can explain to somebody in 30 seconds. So, you know, it's not something really you can use to, to in passing or in a conversation or sometimes even in a, a class maybe, but it's, it's understanding that may help us sometimes at least if we ever get into a conversation with somebody that you can tell they really want to know and they really want to learn, we might be able to explain some things that will just, because learning, learning this kind of stuff in the Bible can just open your understanding. It can make a lot of other stuff 
a lot more clear when you just understand this. So now, uh, it, it, another thing that we can say we're not in the last days. Now we may be right on the threshold of the last days, but until that seven year tribulation begins, we're not in the last days. That, that seven year period of time, that is the, the last day. The last days will restart then. So until that happens, we're not in the last days. We may be in the last days of this time period we're in, <laughs> coming up to it, but that's not the biblical definition of the last days. All right. He says, back to verse 17, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, here's another uh, place where error has crept in and this statement where it said where the Lord speaks this I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh now there's there's a context for this prophecy and the context is it's like there's brackets on each end and within those brackets that there is a category of people and that is Israel. This is not talking about all people on the face of the earth. We know that because when this happened, the Holy Spirit was not poured out on everybody on the earth. It happened in Jerusalem to the Jews, to the people of Israel. That's who this came to, and that's who this happened. So a lot of people, and I know the Kind of the Pentecostals, Charismatics, they, you know, they, they look at this and, and they support their premise of their whole belief system from those statements like this. That it poured out his spirit upon all flesh. Well, that means everybody. So, well, it, it, it doesn't mean everybody. It means everybody of Israel. And even within that, it would be the believers because those unbelievers, like these up here that said, ah, those guys are just drunk. They didn't receive the Spirit. And so if they, even those within Israel, if they weren't believers, uh, then they wouldn't receive the Spirit. Not all of them got it, just the ones that believed. So uh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, we know about them speaking in tongues. We know about some of the prophesying because these believers... That's what they were doing. As when they were speaking, as the Spirit gave them utterance, they were prophesying. They were proclaiming forth the wondrous works of God, mainly the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and other things too. But they were prophesying. Now, uh, about the uh, young men seeing visions and old men dreaming dreams, I thought about, do we have... Do we have any examples of, of that happening? And I'm not doubting that it did. Apparently, if it did, and if it was as widespread, say, as the manifestation of speaking in tongues, then not much of it got recorded. We have a few examples. Um, Peter had a vision uh, was we'll see over in chapter I think nine and ten where he was up on the roof in uh, in uh, Joppa and he saw the vision of the big sheet coming down with all the animals in it. He had a vision while he was praying. Um, Philip, Philip the evangelist. Uh, there's a play we'll see this as we go through here. His daughters were prophets. They they prophesied. Um, Paul had visions. You know he had a vision of of the Lord Jesus Christ several times on the road to Damascus and there were other times when he had visions of Christ and communicated with him. Uh, Ananias had a vision, the one, you know, the one who went and got Paul and prayed over him and, and uh, baptized him and all that. He had visions. There was uh, Agabus, that we'll see as we go through here. He was a prophet and uh, so like that. So uh, apparently this did happen. We don't have a lot of accounts of their visions and old men dreaming dreams and things like that. So I'm sure that to them it, it 
meant something probably uh, there's there's probably something more significant there that I didn't dig out and uh, uh, so anyway we we know to an extent that happened probably more than what's recorded here uh, verse 18 and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy now here's one reason why I think that it could be very likely that possibly sometime around the beginning of the seven year tribulation when God begins to call out the believing remnant of Israel that are alive at that time I wonder if a uh, if a dual fulfillment of this prophecy is going to happen because you know Peter said this will come to pass in the last days well as far as they were concerned they were in the last days and if God hadn't suspended their program and brought in the dispensation of grace they would have been in the last days and all those end time things would have happened back then um, so I wouldn't be surprised if this Pentecostal experience is not repeated at some time early in the uh, in the tribulation. In fact, this something like this, a, a dual fulfillment of this prophecy, could be what triggers or begins to call out the believing remnant of Israel. Now, here's another reason why I think. There could be another fulfillment of this in the end. Let's go and look at verse 19 and 20 and 21. He says, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Peter had just said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that shall come to pass in the last days. Now, here are a lot of signs that match the opening of the sixth seal. Prophetic event that is still yet in the future. These things didn't happen. There were no wonders in heaven above. There were no signs in the earth beneath. And, and the signs in the, you know, the the wonders in heaven above, that's remember back when we were going through Revelation, we we're talking about those, you know, star falling from the sky to the ocean and mountain being ripped up, flaming mountain ripped up and thrown into the ocean and the earthquakes and the, all that stuff going on. Those are the signs in the earth that, that he's talking about here. And the wonders in the heavens above. Uh, and the blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun should be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. None of that happened. None of that. There, wasn't, there weren't signs in heaven above. There weren't any signs in the earth beneath. There was no blood, no fire, no vapor of smoke. The sun didn't turn dark. The moon didn't turn into blood. And the great and notable day of the Lord did not come within their lifetimes. It didn't happen at that time. Even though the first part of this, this prophecy did happen at that time. So that shows us that between verse 18 and 19, something happened. Because 19, 20, and 21, that all the, you know, uh, sun turned to darkness and moon into blood and uh, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, all that stuff was supposed to have happened. When this prophecy was fulfilled, all that was supposed to happen too. But it didn't happen. Why did it not happen unless something changed at some point? And this is one reason why we, we stand on rightly dividing the word of truth and that something happened here and God stopped Israel's prophetic program. Because if he hadn't stopped Israel's prophetic program when Stephen was stoned to death, then all of this stuff would have happened in the great and terrible day of the Lord would have come and judgment would have come at some time at this point. And there would have been no Apostle Paul, would have been no 
dispensation of grace and, and all that, what we're in now never would have happened. So by the fact that these prophetic things did not happen, that indicates to us that there was a major change at this point right here. And God opened the way of, of grace and so forth. So when, you know, these are the kind of things that show us that it's important that we understand Bible prophecy and we understand what's going on there. And we ask these questions when we're reading through here. We see, well, yeah, the first part of this uh, down through verse 18, the prophesying and seeing visions and dream dreams and pour out his spirit on the uh, handmaids and so forth. All that happened. But 1920 and 21, none of that happened. And on down there, uh, uh, we'll go ahead and, I know that, yeah, that, that, is a, that is a truth for us from, from our perspective of the gospel. Anybody that will call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in faith will be saved from their sins. But that's, that's not what Peter's talking about here. This is specific to these other things that he was just talking about. He's talking about the, you know, the blood and fire and vapor of smoke and, and all of these things. Great and terrible day of the Lord coming with terrible wrath and destruction on the earth to uh, bring about those final ends and the Lord putting his enemies down and conquering them and uh, so on like that. Well, this, this specifically, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is specific to that particular time because the saved there is, uh, I think it's the word sozo, which means a physical deliverance. It, it's not saved in the sense like we think of being saved. We accept Christ and we're changed. We're given the life of Christ. Our sins are forgiven and we're going to heaven when we die. That to us, that's, that's being saved. And that's accurate for us. But it's different for them because to them, saved meant physical deliverance from the coming day of judgment and entry into the coming kingdom of the Messiah. So it's a little different there. And we, we just need to be clear on when statements like this are made, what is it connected to instead of trying to pull it out of there and stand it up as a kind of a mantra that, uh, you know, while it's true, we're taking it out of its place. So uh, let's look at some uh, 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 related prophetic scriptures because this will help us place this prophecy of Joel into a proper time. Let's go back over to Isaiah 13. These details are some really prominent prophetic details uh, in Bible prophecy. These are some of the things and details that continue to show up when they're talking about uh, the, the very last end times of the coming day, great and terrible day of the Lord. It's just like the common thing we talked about before. We're talking about Christ return and he's coming with the clouds and power and glory and angels and all that okay isaiah 13 um where am I at? I know I had a... here it is six verse six howl ye for the day of the lord is at hand it shall come as a destruction from the almighty therefore shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, both cruel or cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, 
He will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. It will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. So here we find a description, and this is the great and terrible day of the Lord that uh, Peter and the disciples were all looking to happen. Now let's go over to... Uh, Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 29. Of course, Matthew 24 is famous Jesus uh, talking to his disciples about uh, prophetic events and so on. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, this, hit, this hits home with Peter and with a, a lot of the folks that are there because what do we see here? We see a group of Jews from all the nations of the known world at the time. And they're all gathered here in Jerusalem. So this prophecy that is being fulfilled, they are well aware of it. And they know what it means. And they're understanding the warning that Peter is giving them. Because, uh, you know, I mean, he's going to tell them over here to few verses that uh, they crucified their Messiah and they're guilty of it. They're, these folks he's talking to uh, well he's going to you know, point it out but they're also going to understand that they have fulfilled that prophecy of Psalm 2 where the uh, rulers of Israel and kings of the Gentiles conspired together against the Lord and his anointed and so forth like that. So these Prophetic events, as Jesus gives us a timeline where he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then you'll see these things come to pass. So we know this is going to happen at the end of that 70th week, and it will be the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord's judgment, accompanied by these signs. These didn't happen at that time so we know that they are yet still in the future, yet to happen. So let's go on with Peter's uh, message. Should I need to forget anything? Yeah. Okay. Uh, ye men of Israel, <clears throat> hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, he, first of all, it's important and it's significant that, uh, Peter makes it clear that it was Jesus of Nazareth. As we go through, or if you, if you read through here, these first chapters of, of Acts, it's one of the things that you're, uh, you're going to notice that outside of like Peter and James and John, the few that are recorded here, Stephen, uh, when it's talking about any of the rulers of the Pharisees or any of them, 
They will not mention Jesus' name. They never mentioned his name. And there's a reason for that. And that is because they considered his name cursed because he was crucified. They considered anybody that hung on a tree was cursed. They considered him cursed of God. And anybody that was cursed of God, their name was also cursed. Anybody that was related to them or associated with them, they were also cursed and so on. So that's why they wouldn't, uh, that's why they wouldn't speak his name. It's also one reason why Peter, we'll see over there in chapter 4, he makes a statement over there, I think it's uh, chapter 4, verse 29, neither is there any name under heaven whereby men must be saved, and so forth. No, and that's why he spells it out here, Jesus of Nazareth. And as we'll see over in uh, chapter 3, when they heal, the, heal the, the lame man there at the temple, he says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Because I mean, Peter was adamant in speaking Jesus' name and making it clear that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. So anyway, we see that through here, uh, that uh, Peter and some of the others, they, uh, they speak his name clearly, and make, make it clear who he was and that he was the Messiah. Uh, he was approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, uh, the miracles are always to demonstrate God's power to do something, as in raising somebody from the dead. God's the only one that can do that. So raising people from the dead, that's a, uh, a miracle. Also, uh, heal, miracle healings and uh, things like that, you know, those are miracles. They demonstrate God's power at work. Wonders are designed to have an effect on people, to change them somehow or uh, ha have a, 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 like a, a life-changing influence over people. That's what the wonders are for. And then signs are to teach or inform people of something. So the signs, wonders, and miracles, they're not all the same thing. They each are specific, and they each have a specific purpose for why they, why they were done. And all of the ones Jesus did were right out of the prophetic scriptures, Isaiah 35 and, and some others, many others, uh, specific things he did that were signs that validated him as the Messiah. Uh, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So a lot of those people in that crowd that Peter's talking to they had first-hand knowledge. A lot of those people had encountered Jesus. They had seen him. They had heard him when he taught in the temple. A lot of the, these same people in this crowd, these guys, and these people, a lot of them were probably there when Jesus was teaching in the temple, and they brought in the woman taken in adultery. And they all had rocks in their hands. We, you know, the law says we should stone her to death. What do you say? He says, well, go ahead. And whichever one of you is without sin, <laughs> cast the first stone. Uh, and so on. And those kind of things. Uh, other healings and miracles that Jesus did. And they heard him teach. They had firsthand knowledge of that. They saw those things. And they couldn't deny it. Uh, so, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So that's a pretty good indictment against, the, uh, against them uh, about, uh, you know, that they were guilty. I mean, it was by them. They were, these, these same guys in this crowd that he's talking to, a lot of them were the same ones that stood out there and said, crucify him, crucify him, let, let us have Barabbas, you know, and uh, crucify Jesus. Same ones. They uh, they made the decision. Probably a lot of the rulers were standing there, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and those guys were standing there listening to Peter at the same time as he began this, this message here and uh, made, uh, made it absolutely clear. You guys are the ones who put him to death, and he was the Messiah. Verse 24, <clears throat> but he says, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And this is, this is really a great, and this is one of those statements that it's easy to just read right by. 
But there's a great theological principle here that is absolutely indispensable. And one of the things that we need to be absolutely clear about, and that is that even though the Lord Jesus Christ allowed himself to be put under death, it was not possible that death could hold him under its power. I mean, it just, uh, it, it couldn't happen uh, for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that death, Satan and Satan who had the power of death, had no legal claim on Jesus' life. <laughs> None at all. She's barking at herself. Uh, so, and this bring, brings up a whole thing. We're not going to go way into this. There's a lot of it. I don't, I'm, I don't know really if you explain it all that well, or if I understand it all that well. But there's certain legalities. Uh, the thing about God is that He is absolutely fair and just. And anybody that can make a legitimate claim, God, who is absolutely fair and just, he'll honor that claim. So if, if Satan, and his, through his power of death, if he could have made some claim against the Lord Jesus Christ that would stick, then he would have had grounds to keep him under the power of death. But when Christ allowed himself to go under the power of death, it became evident that there was no great, it's like he, he allowed himself to be put in prison, in jail. But when everything was examined, there was nothing, nothing, no grounds for keeping him there. And they had to release him. So, you know, for that three days and three nights that he was, in the grave and a number of things likely that he, he did, the scripture gives us some small clues about. We wish we knew more, but we don't. Anyway, uh, death could not hold him and he rose from the dead because it was not possible that he could be held by it. Death had no claim over him. Death has a claim over all of us, even though we have the power of resurrection. We know that in Christ, death does not have a permanent hold even over us. Even if we go under death one day, uh, we can be confident we won't stay there forever because just as Christ was raised from the dead, uh, we also will be raised from the dead because we have his life, that life and that righteousness that could not, that it was not possible that death could hold we have that. And man, that's the, that's the greatest thing, you know, that's the greatest thing, greatest thing ever. That we're partakers of that. We have an inheritance of that with Christ. And, uh, uh, that power over death, that it's, it, it's a gift, free gift to us. It's part of what we get in, you know, in grace, the working of grace that was accomplished through his death. And those things that uh, seemed like uh, defeat, and just the genius that only God could do, he took the very thing that Satan thought would, would put him on top and give him one up. That was the very thing that doomed him by bringing Christ under death because Satan, who, I have a theory about this, was pretty good about staying within the bounds that were set even for him, even as evil as he is. Still, there were bounds set, and he stayed within those. But, and even Paul talked about this, if those princes of this world know what would happen, they wouldn't have put Christ to death. Because the very thing that Satan thought he engineered to thwart God's plan was the very thing that defeated him. Because what he was not thinking about was that he had no legal right to put Christ under death. But when he did, it was an injustice that had to be answered. And it was an injustice that Christ's righteousness and his life overcame. 
So, uh, <clears throat> thank God for that. And we're partakers of that as well. Uh, where are we? Yeah, let's, let's go to uh, about, oh, down to through about verse 28, I think. There for tonight. More prophecies that David spoke. David speaks concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So here back in the Psalms, David wrote these things. And he wrote, and there, there are a number of places where David wrote about uh, the resurrection and so forth like that. Uh, a lot of Messianic Psalms and so forth. But he, he said in verse 27, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or the, the place of the dead. Uh, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And we know that Jesus physically in his body, he saw no corruption like, uh, you know, normally happens after a person dies. It didn't happen to him. And uh, normally, and as they believe, and it's kind of true, uh, the body didn't really begin to suffer corruption at least as far as their burial practices, until after about three days. And we know uh, we have an example of that from uh, Lazarus when he was buried. Martha you know, said, well, he's been buried for four days. And by this time, it's going to be pretty bad. We should just leave him alone. But uh, Christ, three days and three nights in the tomb. But uh, this prophecy was fulfilled that uh, he would rise from the dead. Now, one of the things, and it's important that Peter quoted these verses here to this group, it is because I'm sure they had a lot of explanations about what that meant. They probably thought, well, it meant that David, David would be resurrected and he would once again sit on the throne of Israel, which there's kind of reason to believe that could happen. Uh, they, uh, some of them interpreted it to think, well, it was talking about Israel, that Israel will rise again, and they'll, you know, rise to prominence again, and so forth. But it may be that none of them thought that it uh, applied to the Messiah, because it was absurd for them to think that the Messiah could be killed, because he was going to come back in the spirit and power of Elijah. He could call down fire from heaven and do miracles and all these things. How is he going to be overcome? How would he be put to death and so forth like that? It was absurd to them. So at this point, it's important that Peter uses these scriptures because now these Jews know exactly what that meant. And not only are they going to be enlightened by this, but they're going to go back and they're going to start digging into the scriptures and they're going to find more and more. And this is going to be one of those keys that is going to open their understanding. And they're going to go back and dig into the scriptures and they're going to begin to begin to see more and more of how those prophetic prophetic things applied to the Lord Jesus Christ and pointed to him as their Messiah and so forth. This is what the disciples are going to do. We're going to see over here where they uh, are, where, I think we already, where they, uh, where they get the deacons and all that. And they make the statement, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and, and the word. Well, it's because they had to. And they were learning and people were coming in there and they were seeing these things and they were going, digging back into their scriptures and they were seeing how, man, these things point right to the Messiah. The, all, Jesus did all these things. How could we have missed this? How could we have been so blind and not seen this, you know? It was, it was amazing, the things they were learning and how they were growing. So we'll, we'll see that as we go on through. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll stop right here tonight. And uh, pick up in uh, verse 29 next time. And we'll go through.
questions or anything for discussion? It's all this extremely confusing. Do y'all do y'all remember much about when we went through that series on the cycles of judgment? Well, I hope so because I tell you that study on the five cycles of judgment is one of the most important things anybody can ever learn about the Bible. I mean, it just gives you an outline of the whole plan right there. It's a shame that really so few people see that or, or understand it. It's a shame. You know, churches don't teach that to their people. Because, man, it would just open up a lot of people's Bible understanding. So, anyway. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, let's pray and we'll 